Amen. What a powerful time of worship. Praise God. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, we are going to be over in 1 Peter this morning and just um, trying to listen to the Lord week after week. And I know we had planned Galatians a couple weeks ago, but we'll just see. Uh, we should begin to, to be in the book of Galatians here at some point. But uh, if you've got your Bibles, 1 Peter 4 is where we're going to be at um, today. And, you know, as I was thinking over the sermon last week, it really didn't hit me until this morning that I really could have and should have called that listening for his coming. And, you know, over at least today, probably next week, I want to talk about uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus as we did last week. I did not realize as I began to crunch numbers and look at verses how many times the coming of the Lord uh, appears in the word of God. Um, and, and it's, we are warned, we are told, we know that the Lord Jesus is coming soon. And, um, and dear friend, may we live like it. Amen. May we, may we believe it so much so that it translates into everything that we do. Um, and truly, as we just saying, everything that we do needs to honor and glorify and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, last week, the, one of the key verses was, First Peter, I mean, First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, which says that for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And now we, we're going to hear three sounds with a shout. There's one. The Lord's going to shout. The second sound would be the voice of the archangel. And the third sound would be the trumpet of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I do believe that Jesus is coming soon. I believe that. And, uh, you know, when we were... As a family and our boys were younger, we would travel to the beach, and I'm sure you went through this. I, I, I'm sure I uh, probably annoyed my parents doing this. You know, I would ask the question, how much father, how much father? And I know as we would go on vacation and we're traveling to the beach, you know, hey, mom, dad, how much longer do we have? Uh, son, we've only been in the car 30 minutes. I mean, we, we've got a ways to go yet. And, uh, you know, 45 minutes later, then as they grew up, then it, it became this where, you know, they would see palm trees and, oh, we're getting close. They would see the sound and they would say, oh, is that the ocean? No, that's not the ocean. We're still not there yet. And, 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 but yet what you're seeing is signs of the ocean. We're getting close. We're almost there. And, dear friend, the signs are all around us that the coming of the Lord draws near. Uh, as, as we've seen in, in the word of God that when you look around you and you see that the days that you live in resemble the days of Noah, you know the coming of the Lord draws nigh. And we see these days that we live in that look like the days of Noah. And maybe next week we'll talk about that. The days of Noah versus the day that we're living in today. But, dear friend... We are not seeing just palm trees. We are not looking at just the sound as the body of water. No, no, no. Dear friend, where we are at, I believe, and theologians are telling us and preachers are preaching that we are walking along the edge of the sand so close to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that the waves are, are splashing and the spray of the water is hitting us in our faces. That's how close we are to the coming of the Lord. And I believe that. And I pray that you believe it. These are different days that we live in. First Peter chapter 4 tells us how we are to live in these days. And you know what? I want you to know that. We looked at it last week, listening to the sounds, listening for the coming of the Lord. I want to give you today at least five more things that we need to be doing as we await the coming of the Lord. And we find them all right here in 1 Peter. Look at verse 7 if you would. It says this, but the end of all things is at hand. Wow. The end of all things. Did you hear that? What is he saying there? He is saying that this dispensation that we are living in today is going to come to a close. The end is coming. That's what Peter's telling us. The end is coming. The end of all things is at hand. And therefore, look what he says to do. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. He goes on to say, he says, above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. 
Look at verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do so as with the ability in which God supplies. That in all things, we just sang this, that in all things may God be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Dear friend, as we see verse 7 here, Peter is telling us that the end of all things is at hand. Dear friend, the coming of the Lord is right around the corner. You see that? One of the best signs that I know of are people today who say, oh, they've been saying that for a long time. They've been saying that for a long time. This isn't new. Oh, well, you're a fulfillment of the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Because in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 44, the Lord Jesus said, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. We're living in a world today that's not looking for the coming of Jesus. We, our churches aren't looking for the coming of Jesus. The people who are to be are to be looking for the coming of Christ, are not looking for the coming of Christ. Let me give you proof of it. In Hebrews, we're told this, and so much the more, as you see the day of the Lord approaching, we are to what? We are to be in the Lord's house. We don't see the church blooming, prospering, growing with people of God because we're in the last days. We see the opposite. We see people predominantly in churches walking away and turning away from God. And dear friend, let me say this. It's because we're not looking for it. We're not ready for it. And the only way to be ready for it is to live ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do today is I want to give you a few things and how we can do that. Amen. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of the living God will put urgency in your heart, will put emergency in your life for these days that we are living in. Amen. Amen. That we won't walk around ho-hum, that we won't have a half effort in our walk with God. Listen, but that we'll be all in. And that's what this message is a call to be. Number one, I want you to learn of his coming. Learn of his coming. Look at verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You know what the word serious means? To be serious-minded. Now, you've got to get serious in your thinking. You've got to get serious in your learning about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we saw last week, the word of God has so much to say about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friend, I've read the word. I know where it's all coming to. I get that question a lot. What is the world coming to? I know what the world is coming to. Let me tell you something, dear friend. The kingdoms of this world are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what all of this is coming to. And let me say this. You cannot make sense out of history. And many times you'll never be able to make sense out of life until you view everything through the lens of the coming of Christ. You know, just this week, I met Margot Brake over at a nursing home. Thank God for her heart. She said, here, here, is a, here is a guy, he's lost, he doesn't know Christ. Would you meet me over there? I've tried to win him to Christ. He's not coming to Christ. Would you meet me over there? We went over there, walked into the room. I think he and his roommate maybe came to Christ. Margot said, I want, I want you to meet someone else on our way out. We went into a room and I met my sister. In Christ, one of them that I'd never known before. She loved Jesus with all of her heart. She laid there in that bed, pale, gray in her color, very sick. We didn't stay very long. I grabbed her by her toes. I said, let me pray with you. I know there may be some today who are in nursing homes and they're going to watch this because they can't be here. Or they might see this down the road and some who are at home and they're sick and they're asking a question, why God, why am I so sick? I love you with all of my heart. And this dear lady loved the Lord with all of her heart. She didn't complain as she laid there. She still said, God is good. I love the Lord. But dear friend, let me tell you something. Even in moments of sickness and trial and heartache, sometimes we wonder why. Why? 
But let me tell you something, dear friend. If you see the world and you see what you face and you see what you go through through the lens of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, just to realize that sin has wrecked our bodies. Sin has wrecked our world. And the more we sin, the worse it gets. And God didn't create this as we see it. God created a garden. He put a man and a woman in it. And he called it good. And sin broke out. And sin continues to swell we see the evidence all around us and dear friend if you can only see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ if you can see it you get an abundance of answers listen sickness here doesn't have the final word tragedy here doesn't have the final word God does one day he's going to come and set up his kingdom and he is going to rule and reign. But I want to tell you something, church. <sighs> Please hear the words of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, and all who live godly in Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution. We don't like that, do we? But the truth be told... If you are lost and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're living for the world, guess what? The devil probably isn't messing with you too much. I will say this about you. You don't have peace in your heart. But let me just be real and honest with you about something. If you come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, motion causes friction. And when you come to Christ and you receive him as your Lord and your Savior and you begin to serve him and live for him, let me tell you something. The devil isn't going to let you go without a fight. And he's not going to allow you to serve him and just enjoy this Christian life without a fight. This is going to be a battle. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let me tell you what Paul is telling us there, dear friend. That whatever suffering you face, whatever it is that you go through, dear friend, let me tell you, listen, it's not in void. as It's not in vain as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 says. Dear friend, one day when we stand before our Savior's presence, we will see see and we will know that it all was worthwhile you see we've got to learn of his coming we've got to learn of it number two I want you to see this I want to admonish you today from first Peter 4 to look for his coming learn of it learn to apply it to every area of your life but also dear friend look for his coming Look again at verse 7, if you will. It says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Let me tell you a little. I learned this the hard way this week. So I'm believing by faith that we're going to have a youth pastor next Sunday. I believe in that. I ordered his computer this week by faith. That's what God put in my heart to do. I did something I typically don't do. I went online and I went to Best Buy and I ordered this computer. It said this, it'll be to the church on Wednesday. I signed up as I checked out for all of the tracking information. Text me, email me, call me. Every box I could check, I checked it. You know? And so here comes Wednesday and I get a text. And it says, your computer will soon arrive. Be looking because you got to sign for it. That's in essence what the text said. So I heard a truck out in the parking lot. I thought, here it is. I went up to the door. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't UPS. It was the, dump, the dumpster guy. <laughs> he was here to empty the trash. I thought, oh, man, that's not UPS. And then I heard someone pull in the parking lot. I thought, that's them. I came out back out to the door seven or eight times on Wednesday. Looking, waiting, every sound, everything I heard, that's it. Here they are. Woo! And I go, to the, I go to the front door. I didn't want anybody else to be burdened with me, you know, and me ordering this computer. I'm like, okay, I'll go and I'll sign. I'm ready. Seven or eight times, every single time, it wasn't the UPS guy. At 5.04, I got an update on the, on the tracking, and here's what it said. Computer unable to be delivered, no one at the residence. I thought, what? <laughs> no one at the residence? You've got to be kidding me. 
So then, a few minutes later, it updated and said it'd be delivered tomorrow. So here comes Thursday, right? So guess what happened around Thursday? I'm doing the same thing. Every sound, I'm listening. I'm waiting. I get a text. Your computer's coming soon. Be ready to sign. All the same stuff, right? But I'm not going to the door every single time I hear something this time. I have work to do. UPS guy can wait on me this time. I've been waiting on him. So guess what? Two something, two o'clock in the day, UPS guy pulls up. He comes in. I'm thinking, all right, great. He opened up the door for him. He brings in two big boxes of paper, lays them down, and I close the door behind us both, and I'm walking to his truck with him. I said, I know you got another package. He said, package? He said, I don't have another package. Huh? I said, wait a minute. It says that you have a computer that is supposed to be delivered to us today. He said, oh, yeah, well, we had it yesterday, but it was put on the wrong truck, and it's not on my truck today. What? <laughs> I said, well, let me tell you something. This gets all the more marvelous because guess what? I waited around all day yesterday, and I said this in a very fine, fun, loving Christian way. Don't worry. I said, you know what? I waited all day yesterday, and you guys stamped on your website on the tracking that no one was at the residence. I was at the residence all day waiting. You know what he said? He said, oh, we do that when we can't make it in time. So after 5 o'clock, we post that, and we go on home, and enjoy our families, and I said, okay, well, where's the computer? So he wrote me down a phone number. I called the phone number. She said, sir, we don't know where the computer's at. But you know what? Through all of that, why do you tell me all this stuff, preacher? Let me tell you why. Because God spoke to my heart and said, the way you're looking for the computer is the way you need to look for my coming. Amen. Every sound, every voice, everything in our society, to have that same expectation, that same waiting, listen, that same urgency, that same, it could be today. Could be before this service is over. How many of you have had that thought today? I'm going to church today because the Lord could come today, huh? I'm going to church today and worship Him because He could be this week. I'm going to sing with unction. I'm going to sing with function. I'm going to pour my heart out to God, huh? How many of us are living with that kind of urgency? Dear friend, oh, how we need to be looking for the coming of the Lord. I love what D, uh, Dr. G. Campbell Morgan said. He was a preacher of yesteryear and a powerful one at that, greatly used of God. But listen to what he said. He was so greatly used of God because listen to his mission statement. Listen to what he said. He said, I never lay my head on the pillow without thinking that perhaps before I awake, the final morning may have dawned. I never begin my work without thinking that he may interrupt it before he begins his own. And every night, listen to what he said, before I go to sleep, we ought to say this. Well, he might come tonight. Every day when we grab our tools and we go to work, this may be the last day of work. And he said we are to be looking for the coming of Christ. Amen. We are to live with that kind of expectation, looking for the coming of the Lord. Let me give you the third thing, dear friend. Not only learn, but dear friend, we are to long for the coming. Learn, look. The third thing is long for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. He says this, be watchful in your prayers. Do you see that? Be watchful. Now, what kind of prayer is this? He's talking to the church. It was a suffering church, by the way. It was a church that, dear friend, they were cheated out of jobs. They weren't given certain jobs because they were Christians. Their income wasn't uh, what it should be because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And they suffered persecution greatly in their society for their love of Jesus. And look at what he says here. Be watchful in your prayers. What does that mean? You see, dear friend, when you look for him to come, you also are going to pray for him to come. Did you know that through your prayers, you can cause the Lord Jesus Christ to come more quickly than he will come if you don't pray? Did you know that? You say, oh, preacher, I've heard it's a fixed date. I don't know about that. Well, that's not what the Bible says. It's not a fixed date. I did a lot of reading from some Greek theologians this week. I'm not a Greek scholar. I 
vaguely know Greek, whatever I can pronounce, I cannot spell. And so I vaguely know it, so I read Greek scholars. I've got a lot of great Greek references, and I did some study on, uh, on 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, which says this, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And what this phrase, hastening the coming of the day of God, means in the minds and the explanation, uh, explanation of many Greek scholars is simply this, that if we pray and ask God to come, he will come sooner. That's what they all said, that that statement means and dear friend, didn't Jesus teach us in Matthew chapter 10, uh, 6 and verse 10, to pray for his kingdom to come? Isn't that what he taught us? We are to pray for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've heard me say this many times. What is the last prayer of the Bible? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. What is the last prayer of the Bible? Even so come, Lord Jesus Come, I want to ask you something, dear friend. Are you praying for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know what? I love the Lord Jesus Christ personally. I can't wait to see him. I can't wait to walk with him. I can't wait to talk with him. I can't wait to be in his presence. I've experienced things like this from time to time in my life. I obviously dated my wife. We didn't live together. We went separate places prior to marriage, and I was so tired of that. I often wondered what it would be like to not say goodnight. I was so thankful for marriage that ever since then, we've never went separate places. We've, unless I was on a missions trip or something like that, it's, always been a blessing to experience that when our son moved out and he went on his honeymoon you know kind of waiting for their return with anticipation of when are they going to get back home you know we don't want to hound you we want you to have your space but I'll never forget the day that they pulled in after their wedding in the early service I was Preaching and Keith and Carol St. Clair set out over in this section and I was reminded of their son being in Afghanistan for eight months and, 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 I, and, and Keith and I were texting back and forth and as you and I and as we as a church prayed for their son in Afghanistan that he would get home safely. Keith texted me, he's coming home today. What do you think Keith did? Carol. You think they went shopping? Well, we better get some extra groceries. While we're out here, we might as well go to the mall and get some new shoes. Maybe we'll just go and eat it out back while we're out here, you know? Do you think that's what they did? Or do you think that they stayed at home patiently waiting, listening for every sound, awaiting the return of their son, longing to do what? Longing to see him, longing to embrace him. Can you imagine what that first hug must have felt like? You see where I'm going with this? Can you imagine the day that we see our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ? Oh, dear friend, we are to be longing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you number four here. We are to love until he, his coming. We are to love until he comes. Dear friend, when the Lord Jesus comes, may he find us loving one another. You're in 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, and above all things. Listen to what Peter said here. Above everything else. Above everything. He says all things. To me, all means all. And it's all, all means. Like above all that you do. Look at what he says. Have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. In verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. You know, the Greek word here for love in this text is the word agape. Now, you're familiar with that love. We, it means a godlike love. It means a love that you give regardless of what you get. Amen? 
And you know what, dear friend, I promise you in the church you're going to have to practice this. I promise you in your family you're going to have to practice this. I promise you at work you're going to have to practice this. You're going to be challenged in it. And I want to tell you this, you're not going to be able to do it in the strength of your own flesh. This is a supernatural thing here. This is something that only the Holy Spirit of the living God can do in our hearts and allow us to love people in this way. Simon Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, looking at this suffering church and looking at the persecuted church, and he's telling them, await, look for, long for the coming of Christ, and until he comes above everything else, love one another. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12 tells us something about these latter days that we live in. I want you to hear it. It says, and because lawlessness will abound. I never thought we'd be living in a day and age where a man in a blue uniform with a badge would mean nothing. That they would be the target of mockery because they stand for the law. Dear friend, we've never seen this before in our culture. What do we see? We see lawlessness abounding in our culture. And look at what the Lord Jesus says here. In the end times, lawlessness will abound. And don't miss this. The love of many, many will grow what? It'll grow cold. You know what that means? You know what it means? Because lawlessness will abound, lovelessness will abound. Because lawlessness will abound, there will be a great lovelessness even in the church. What Peter is saying is don't let that be you. Not, don't, don't be found this way upon the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you, don't you be that person. Don't you be that church. Don't let the devil keep you from loving in these latter days. And above all things, he says, have fervent love. I want to ask you a question. Why does he say above all these things, have a love that is an agape love, have a love that is a fervent love? Why? Why? Does he tell us in these latter days, above everything else, be filled with the love of God? I want to tell you why. Letter A here, because love is the greatest virtue. You're familiar with 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13. It lists a lot of great things, but then it goes on to say this, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Uh, wait a minute, greater than faith? Greater than hope? He says greater than these is love. It's the greatest virtue. And letter B, I'd love for you to jot this down. Not only is love the greatest virtue, but notice this. Love is the greatest commandment. It's the greatest commandment. Somebody came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 37, and said these words, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said in verse 37, he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Now, dear friend, if it's the first and great commandment, it ought to be at the forefront of what we do. Amen? To love. You know what else love is? Please hang in here and listen. I want you to get this. Love is the greatest testimony. It's the greatest testimony. I want to ask you a question. What is really going to make Lighthouse Bible Church or what is going to make the church a truly great church for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it going to be the new sanctuary you'll hear? You've heard about that already this morning. Is it going to be when we build this? When we build this, everybody says, when you build that, they will come. <laughs> I personally believe Jesus ought to be enough for them to come. I don't care if I meet in a gym. I don't care if it's concrete floors. I don't care if it's hot. I don't care if it's uncomfortable. I don't care if the parking lot's full. You know what? We need a generation of people who doesn't care about these things. They're just going to come because Jesus is enough. Yeah. Right? Those are the people we want here. But Jesus is enough. But if we build a sanctuary, you think that's going to spread the light of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that going to help us get the gospel out? It'll help, but that's not the answer. You know what? The amount of our budget, is that what we're looking to, to accomplish this? How about this? How about how the flower beds look? No. You know how people are going to know that we know Christ? John chapter 13 and verse 35 tells us. It says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if 
you have love for one another. I'll tell you the greatest testimony that a church could possibly have is loving each other with an agape kind of love that says, regardless of how you look at me, regardless of how you talk to me, I'm going to love you anyways. And only the Holy Spirit can help you to do that. Let me tell you, it's the greatest form of communicating the gospel is how we love one another. So not only is it the greatest testimony, it's also the greatest motivation. What is it that motivates us to serve the Lord? Why? I see a lot of Lighthouse Christian Academy teachers here today, and we're going to pray over you at the end of the service. But why would you do this? I hate to tell you this. You've already signed your contract, so I'll tell you. You could go make more money doing something else. Why would you do this? You're not supposed to smile and agree with that. We could definitely make more money doing something else. <laughs> no, don't, don't. no, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to say, oh, but we are called here. <laughs> no. What is it that motivates us to serve the Lord? What motivates these teachers to come here every day and to, to be a light of the gospel for the Lord Jesus Christ? Dear friend, what is it that causes people to give sacrificially beyond their tithe into an offering and to watch a building program campaign grow and thrive when the preacher's not even up here talking about it very much. You see, dear friend, what is it that causes one to be faithful in a Sunday school class? I walked by many Sunday school classes this morning just listening at, at, and seeing what God is doing. I went in some of them, went in the new college and career class and saw all those people. I went into uh, went by Brother Daniel's class on my way to do something and Brother Daniel was preaching it up one side and down the other. He was giving it to him. I could hear him all the way down by the nursery and I just, Lord, go Daniel, go Daniel, preach it. What would cause people to fill up Sunday school classes? What would cause people to get off from work and come here in their work clothes on a Wednesday night when it would just be so much easier to go home? What causes people to spend and be spent? What motivates our hearts? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constrains us. Nothing should motivate your heart like a heart that's full of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially, dear friend, and especially his love for you. Dear friend, it should motivate you. And you know what else is? I'll tell you something else, friend. Love is the greatest confirmation. That you have this kind of love is the greatest confirmation. Let me explain that. If you're sitting here this morning wondering whether you are saved or not, wondering if you are a child of God or not, wonder no more. Let me help you answer that. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14 tells us that if this is you, you don't have to wonder about your salvation. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life. In other words, we were lost and now we're saved. We know this has happened because we love the brethren. Did you hear that? Friend, if your heart is a headquarters for hate and bitterness, let me tell you something. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. Love is the mark of a child of God. And above all, if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, what is he telling us to do? That we are to have a fervent love, a passionate love, a compassionate love, a burning love in our hearts for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, what kind of love is this? What kind of love is this love that is a fervent love? Let me give you two thoughts. It's a love that costs. You know, when you love something, it's going to cost you. I don't mean to embarrass him. I don't want to embarrass him, but I watched my son. I sat around the table yesterday with him at over, I think it was dinner, and I looked at him and I said, man, I've never seen anybody love a sport like you love a sport. Every chance he gets, he'll grab his baseball bat. He's out there hitting off of a tee, sweat, hot, loves to play in the rain, loves to play in the snow. He doesn't care. He'll pay the price. I've watched him. You go up for practice. Who's the first one to the pole and back? Who's giving their all? He's giving, their, giving his all. Why? 
Why? Because you know what, dear friend? If you're going to truly excel and exceed at something, you've got to pay a price. You've got to pay a price. It's going to cost you. And you know what? To love like this, the way that God has called us to love, it's going to cost. Look at me. I want to tell you something. I, there have been times, I'll never forget it. I wish she was here in this service. I didn't say in the early service. Edith Lipscomb, I remember when a dear brother in the Lord died. I was up here preaching on a Sunday morning. One of my best friends that came to this church went home to be with the Lord. I found out about it while I was up here preaching. I wrapped up this service. I went to the hospital and held his hand as he went home to be with the Lord. I came back and I looked at Edith and Edith Lipscomb looked at me and she said, I know you're hurting. I said, it hurts bad. I looked at her and I said, you know what? It's hard loving people sometimes, especially when you lose them. She looked back at me and she said, but what are you going to do, preacher? Are you going to just stop loving people? She couldn't have said anything better. I said, no, Edith, I'm not going to stop loving people. And you know what? Some people that I've loved very dearly and poured my life into are some of the ones that have hurt me and betrayed me the most. Do you just stop loving people? Do you let your heart get hard and calloused? And one might say, oh, it'd be easier. It'd be less painful. No, it, you would be miserable. You can't let your heart get hard. You can't let your heart get bitter. Not if the Holy Spirit of the living God lives in your heart. And if the Holy Spirit of the living God lives in your heart, then you must love with an agape love. I want to tell you something. Sometimes it is going to cost you. And let me tell you what else this love will do. It's a love that covers this agape love is one that covers. We talked about this a little bit last Wednesday night, but he goes on to say in verse 8, and above all things have fervent love for one another, for love, notice this, will cover a multitude of sins. You know, as I mowed grass this week, I thought a lot about that statement. I thought, you know what, I've seen it too many times in the church where when people are wounded, we just shoot each other while they're wounded. I've heard gossip too much in church in my life. Been in church my whole life. I've heard too much gossip. I've heard too much of others talking bad about someone else. <laughs> Peter is a great preacher. And Peter is quoting here from a great text in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, which says this hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Hatred takes joy, finds joy in exposing the weaknesses of other people. You know, there are people in the church, I've seen it my whole life, who walk around with the garbage cans. You know that? You don't see them carrying the can, but they got one. You know what they do? They collect all the garbage. And they get enough garbage on someone, they love to share it with other people. They go around picking at the scabs and the scars of someone's life, their wounds and their past. And you know what, dear friend, that's not the love that God has called us to have. As we looked at Wednesday night, the love that we should have in our hearts is finding the good in one another and promoting the good to the body of Christ, not the bad. Let me give you an example of it. And I want to preface this example by saying this. I want to be very clear up front so don't miss what I'm getting ready to say. By no means, by no means am I promoting alcohol and drunkenness. By the way, let me say this. Alcohol always has the tendency to do one thing. It'll do many things, but it'll always do this one. It will relax your morals. Always. And Noah, what did Noah do when he built the ark and traveled on the ark? He got off the ark and he was excited. He had, look at what God had done. And Noah was a good man. We know this. As a matter of fact, he was one of two men in the Bible where the Bible says that he walked with God. Noah walked with God. But when he got off of that ark, he had too much to drink and he laid there in total nakedness. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. 
Ham saw his father laying there in his nakedness and he left his father laying there in his nakedness. And you know what he did? He went and told everyone else about what his father had done. But you know what the other two boys did? They caught word of their father. They went and found a blanket and they held it up between them. And they walked back. They wouldn't even look at their father. They didn't want to see their father in that way. They didn't want that thought in their minds. They didn't know why their father was laying there like that. But they took that blanket and they laid it over him. And dear friend, that's what we ought to be doing in the church. We should be covering one another's garbage and promoting the good that we see in one another. Please hear what I'm going to say. As I was mowing yesterday, the Holy Spirit took my mind to Psalm chapter 23 and verse 3, which says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. When we attack one another in the church, it's not one another that's being attacked and hurt. It's Jesus Christ and his name and his cause and Christ crucified and the mission that you and I are to be on as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ is what's suffering. No wonder the enemy comes against us. He wants us to be like Ham. It just goes and tells everything we see and know. One of the hardest things as a pastor, Pastor Josh, Melissa, a few others have seen things. One of the hardest things being a pastor is keeping my mouth shut sometimes. And I think to myself, if they only knew. But to even love my enemies, I will not tell you what I know. And while some are led astray and drug away, Breaks my heart. I'm still not going to be a ham in a very bad situation. You are called upon and I am called upon and neither of us, none of us can do it. We are called to love our enemies. Even our enemies. Now I want to give you something before we depart from this idea of a love that cares. I mean that covers why don't we practice one thing before we abandon the thought? Why don't we go around and brag on what God is doing in the hearts and the lives of people? You know, last week in the service, we had almost 10 people come in both services to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. One 12-year-old girl got saved. I called her mother uh, after church, knowing the family very well, she answered the phone and she said, I've been praying for my daughter to get saved for two years. And she gave her heart and life to Christ. And on the way home today, she said she's ready to get baptized. Why aren't we talking about these things? You know what some will do when they leave the service today? They'll get in the car, you'll get in the car and you'll drive down the highway and you'll say, you'll say this, I didn't really like the music. What'd you not like about it? I didn't really like that light. I didn't like that sound, or I didn't like that, or this. Some will get in the car and they'll say, man, I love the music. Wasn't it great today? Some will get in the car and say, boy, I really don't like that preacher. He took his coat off while he was preaching. Boy, I really don't like that preacher. His hair is a mess. Boy, I really don't like that preacher because of this or that and the other. And some will get in the car and say, man, the service really touched my heart today. One service, two experiences. People always finding what they're looking for. Always. If you're looking for Jesus, you'll find Jesus. Dear friend, listen, we have to have a love that covers. And let me give you number three here, a love that cares. A love that cares. He says in verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. You know what that means? Go and help the saints. You know somebody needs their yard mowed? Go mow their yard. You need somebody who, who, who needs a meal? Cook a meal. Take it to them. Love on them. Dear friend, when Jesus comes, may he find our hearts pure with the love of the Lord. Amen? 
loving the people of God. Let me give you the last thing here. Number five, we are to labor until he comes. Labor until he comes. Look at what it says in verses 10 to 11. As each one has received a gift, all of you have received a gift. Look at what he says. Minister it to one another. Use the gift. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What beautiful terminology. You know what, dear friend? God has gifted every single one of you to do something. Amen? Every single one of you. How many of you sit there and say, man, I wish I could play the guitar like Charlie. I wish I could sing like Jill. Oh, I wish I could play that keyboard like Dana or Melissa. Can I tell you something? You can't. You might learn to play the piano or keyboard, but you're not going to have throat surgery and begin to sing like Jill. Wouldn't it be good? Hey, I'd love to sing like Jill almost. I mean, it'd be kind of weird if I grabbed a microphone and sounded just like Jill. I won't even attempt it. But you know what, dear friend? God's given you another gift. He's given you another ability. And every single one of you have a gift. You have an ability. And you know what the Lord Jesus said in Luke 19 and verse 13? Listen, we are not to have our heads in the clouds of prophecy. We are to have our feet on the pavement of winning souls for Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 19, 13, do business until I come. Here to use your gifts. What did Pastor Josh tell you? Pastor Josh, when is the ministry fair going to be? September 17th. He remembers dates so well. September, September what? 17th. September what? September what? I'm, I'm looking at you now. September 17th, right? At 10 o'clock. And what's going to happen at 10 o'clock is all of us are going to be in here and tables set up, elders, deacons, ministries of all sorts are going to be all around this place. And you're going to be able to walk around and see different tables and meet different people and meet Sunday school teachers and leaders. And you're going to be able to find out how you fit into that, how you can serve, how you can take the gift that God has given to you and use it for the glory of God in these latter days. You know, let me give you a couple thoughts here. There are speaking gifts not everyone's a preacher. Not everyone's a teacher. Some will testify. Some will exhort. Some will sing. Some will praise. Some will pray. Whatever it is that you do, dear friend, when it comes out of your mouth, it must be uh, seasoned with the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. But some of you have a speaking gift, and you need to use it. You need to use it for the glory of God. The next thing we see here is serving gifts. Not everyone has a speaking gift, but some have serving gifts. You could go and serve Brother Brandon in the back, heading up the, the ministry that that sound booth does. You don't see them, but they're there, and they're working, and they're broadcasting this service all around the world. And people in the Philippines are watching. People in Texas are watching. People are watching at different places of the world because of what these guys do. And they need your help. Thank God for those who run the lights. Thank God for those who work on the air conditioned units. You know what happened last week? Uh, last week we were getting ready to have open house for the school. You know what happened the morning of open house? Some animal crawled up in the ductwork, and when someone walked into the building, it scared the animal. I was told, I was only told, it sounded like a bear on the ceiling. I thought, Sound like a bear on the roof of the church? I'm not kidding, preacher. It sounded like a bear. And that animal fell down, and I don't know exactly what happened, but it died in the process. And the entire vent smelt like what you don't want to smell. It was awful. And what did we do? Well, I walked around trying to figure it out. It smelled awful in the men's bathroom next door. I'm all up in the ceiling. I felt like a little squirrel in the attic of the house. And I'm climbing on beams. I'm looking down in the wall. I don't see anything. But the smell was awful. 
I got down out of the, roof, out of the ceiling. I walked like this because I had fiberglass all over me. It wasn't good. Finally traced the smell to the outdoor unit, and guess who we called? Oba. <laughs> Mr. Ben Oba sent a guy over here, and they found out what the problem was. They took care of us. Not everybody can do that. Thank God that there are those who counsel. Thank God that there are those who come and spray weeds and flower beds. They are serving gifts. They are leading gifts and planning gifts and working gifts and licking, lifting gifts and giving of all of these gifts. And let me tell you something. God has gifted you. Dear friend, if you see we're living in the last times, the latter days, we need to do all that we can while we can. And as 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7 says, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to ask you a question. How many of you this morning enjoyed the praise team and the music? Praise the Lord. Do you know how many people it takes to pull that off? And do you know the people that are on that team, not all of them sing? Jeff, it was great to see you back up here playing the guitar. What a blessing. Kim, it was wonderful to hear you again on the microphone this morning. What a blessing. The harmony. You know, not all of us can harmonize, but some of us can. Not all of us can sing, but some of us can. Not all of us can work sound equipment, but some of us can. Thank God for that. And you know what? There are different gifts and there are different abilities. I said this the other Wednesday night. Someone came up to me and I was talking about gifts and they said, you know, preacher, I just feel like I'm the small toe on the left foot. I looked down and said, I don't know about you, but I like my small toe on my left foot. I'm so thankful I look at my left foot and I got five toes. And you know what? You know why God gave me a left toe on my left foot? To find furniture in the dark. And I'm thankful for it. I shared that a couple weeks ago. I'm thankful for it. You say, well, I'm just a left toe on a left foot. Really? I like my left toe. Listen, don't belittle who you are and how God's wired you and how God's gifted you. It's all a part of the body of Christ. Whether you're a left hand, a right hand, a left leg, right leg, a brain, a heart, whatever. It takes all of you for us to accomplish what it is that God wants us to accomplish. All of you. And if you're not giving of the gift that God has given to you, then you're limiting, you're hurting, you're hindering what God wants to do here in his church. All of you are significant. And God has wired you. And God will strengthen you. And God will help you to do his work. If you'll simply say, God, here I am, use me. Look at me, dear friend. If you believe this message then get up and do something. Show up here in a couple of weeks on the 17th at that ministry fair and you walk around and you see different ministries and what God is doing and you find out how you can be a part of it. Because in these latter days and in these end of times, we need everybody doing all that they can for the kingdom and the glory of God because, listen, let me tell you something. Jesus is coming soon. And one of my prayers this week has been, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. And in a moment, and in the twinkling of an eye, just like the snap of a finger, he's going to step out on those clouds, and he's going to call his children home. And the only way you're going to be ready for it is for you to live ready for it every day. Hastening, looking for, listening for, longing for, loving the people of God until the coming of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together this morning. Dear friend, this morning, if you are here and you say, Pastor, I, I don't know 
that I know Jesus Christ. Well, dear friend, you need Jesus. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He loves you. And oh, how he wants to save you today if you don't know him. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I don't know that I know Christ, but I want to know that I know Christ. I, wanna, I don't want to leave from here today without knowing that I know Christ. Oh, dear friend, if that's you today, if that's you, would you slip your hand up this morning? Would you say, Pastor Jay, I don't know that I know Christ. I don't know that I'm saved. Pastor, would you pray for me this week? Anybody here this morning? Anybody here this morning? Well, church, I want to invite you to do this this morning. I want to invite you to respond to what God is doing in your heart. Well, hello, my friend. Thank you for joining us today for worship. I pray that you will do what others are doing right now. Call upon the name of the Lord to be your Savior. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Invite him into your life today. Surrender your life to him. Turn from your sin. Oh, friend, he'll save your soul. If you do this today, would you write us? Would you call us? Oh, we'd love to hear from you. We've got some material that we would love to send to you that'll tell you what to do next. May God bless you.